This is an episode of Reasonably Sound Classic. For the first 30-some episodes, this podcast was distributed by Infinite Guest, American Public Media's podcast network. Thus, it benefited from blanket broadcast licenses held with every music publisher. After going independent, pretty much all intro, outro, and interstitial music had to be removed. The intro and outro music you're going to hear is an in-progress version of Reasonably Sound's theme, written by Will Stratton. The awkward silences are where act break music used to be, so if you could just imagine like Queen or The Misfits or Kate Bush along the way, that would be great. If you want to support Reasonably Sound in the hopes that maybe one day I'll be able to afford some blanket licenses of my own, you can check out the Patreon at patreon.com forward slash reasonably sound. Okay, on with the show. Wilson and Arno Penzias were working at Bell Labs in New Jersey in 1964. Both physicists and radio astronomers, they were aiming to measure, quote, faint microwave signals of bits of the universe. They were doing this with a piece of equipment called a horn antenna, specifically the Holmdel horn antenna constructed in 1959 for Bell Labs when they were conducting Project Echo, a project which involved communicating with satellites by bouncing signals off large plastic balloons covered in aluminum. The horn antenna looks exactly like you think it does. Massive, horn-looking thing. And I mean massive, attached to machinery which allows it to spin, pivot, etc., with a cute little shack-looking thing on the smaller end of the horn on a hilltop in New Jersey. Wilson and Penzias were thinking, okay, we'll point the horn antenna over here and measure some microwaves from this cluster of galaxies. Point it over there, measure this other star stuff, and over here, and so on and so forth. You know, just see what's up in the neighborhood like Jimmy Stewart in his wheelchair looking out the rear window. Except two dudes, Bell Labs, a horn antenna, Earth, and the cosmos. Except it didn't work out the way they thought it would. And that's what we're going to talk about today. What they didn't end up measuring. What they did end up measuring instead, and why it matters. Spoiler alert, it matters lots. They won the Nobel Prize. So, Big horn, big universe, but no matter where these science gents pointed their science antenna, they don't get the kind of radio waves they thought they would get. They don't get variations in energy or temperature. They get hiss, and only hiss. No matter where they point this thing, hiss. Clusters, supernovas, stars, celestial anything and everything, hiss, hiss, and more hiss. Just a consistent measurement across the whole damn literally everything. Nary a variation. Surely, they thought, their antenna must be broken. So they go outside, give it a look, and what do they see? What is causing their impossibly sensitive, hugely complex piece of machinery to inaccurately record the activities of far-off cosmic aduins a transpiring? None other than that scourge of science, that enemy of expertise, that rat of the sky, pigeons. Inside their impossibly big, impossibly expensive, impossibly accurate and sensitive piece of important science machinery have roosted and made their home pigeons. And worse, 
pooping pigeons, pigeon poop all up on the home Del Horn antenna. Doesn't this avian scourge know that they are impeding science? So Wilson and Penzias trap the pigeons, depoop the horn, and surely the problem will now be solved. Wilson told Slate.com that they mailed the pigeons to a nearby, quote, pigeon enthusiast and began the work of recalibrating their machine. Except that pigeon enthusiast allegedly freed his science-hating detainees and they returned right to the antenna, back to their home, in the horn, on the hill, in the jurors. For science, Wilson says, their technician came to work one day with a shotgun and took care of the pigeon problem. Jersey style. Internet reports claim Wilson says Penzias ordered the hit, while Penzias says exactly the opposite. Classic. Overall, the men and their team spent over nine months adjusting the antenna, trying to get it to read correctly. They fiddled and replaced, calibrated and maintained, but no matter what they did and where they pointed, they got hiss. They thought it might be interference from satellites or nearby New York City, something. But all of those things were ruled out. Eventually, they called their pal, physicist Robert Dick, and asked if he had any ideas. What's the deal with this hissing sound? Well, as it turns out, it's a sound the universe makes. A sound that eventually helped to prove the Big Bang. The universe makes a lot of sounds. Well, I mean, the universe by definition makes all sounds. Contains the total set of sounds which are, or might, or have, or will occur. But, as it turns out, the universe itself also has all kinds of energy fields and cosmic movements and phenomena that end up contributing to what I've seen referred to several times now as the cosmic symphony. A phrase which kind of makes me feel a little queasy. Like... Do we really have to compare the perfectly non-tonal, musically formless sonification of the sum total of space activities to the preeminent expression of the pageantry and purposeful form of the Western musical tradition? I get that there's lots of stuff happening at once in space and it's all governed by some set of complex interlocking rules, the elegance of which is often very, very impressive, if not aesthetically fulfilling, but like, symphony? Really? Anyway, whatever you want to call the amount of noise made by all the stuff out there in space, it's exceptional. The sounds of solar flares and black holes, the magnetic fields and disturbances around planets and their moons, satellites whooshing errant radio transmissions from glob knows where and when just floating around. There's this phenomenon around Earth, it's called the Dawn Chorus, or sometimes simply the Chorus, or Chorus Waves, where electrons interacting with the radiation belts around the planet produce all kinds of chirps and tones, and it sounds remarkably like birds. Here it is. The Dawn Chorus is actually one of the very few cosmic sonic happenings that exists naturally in the range of human hearing. Most of what you might come across is sonified. It's data that exists in another form, microwaves, electromagnetic waves, gravity fields, visual information, which has been turned into sound in an attempt to understand it better. Lots of it has been pitched or sped up, 
turned from low frequencies below the range of human hearing to higher frequencies we can actually perceive or compressed so a sound that would normally take an absurdly long time to play out happens in the span of a minute or two. For instance, here's the sound of a black hole. Now, this sound you're hearing was captured by a telescope. As it exists out there in the deep of space, it's in actuality a B-flat 57 octaves lower than middle C on a normal piano. You may remember that the fundamental frequency of the note an oboe plays to tune the orchestra is 440 hertz, meaning it repeats 440 times a second. By comparison, this note, the black hole note, repeats once every 10 million years. In other words, it is an impossible to conceptualize amount lower than the lowest range of our hearing. I mean, at that point, is it even sound? It's sort of more like cosmic rhythm, extraterrestrial tempo, eonic beats, a galactic Pulse. Okay, I'll stop now. This is all just to say that in order to listen to this stuff happening in space, for lots of it, we have to turn it into something which is listenable. For the reasons above and also because there aren't too many microphones hanging out next to black holes. And even if there were, vacuum of space, no dispersive medium, less stuff to vibrate for sound waves to propagate through to create sound as we know it. Though... It hasn't always been, and even now, sometimes out there in the deep of space, isn't always perfectly silent, murky blackness. We're going to start talking about the Big Bang again now, and eventually make our way back to pigeon lovers Wilson and Penzias. In 2013, a man by the name of John Kramer, a physics professor at the University of Washington, managed to sonify not a currently occurring event in the now universe, but a long past event, which led to the existence of our universe, the Big Bang. The idea behind the Big Bang, in case you need a refresher, which, to be perfectly honest, I did. All I remembered from high school physics class was there was no stuff, and then boom, lots of stuff, is that before there was, well, stuff, there was a very densely packed area of pre-universe stuff. As far as I understand, the Big Bang doesn't really account so much for what was going on before the universe started, but rather the process and conditions that led to its existence. Anyway, densely packed pre-universe starting conditions, hugely dense, lots of energy packed into a potentially infinitely small point at an impossibly high temperature, and suddenly, rapidly, it all expands, and particles begin colliding, creating and destroying all kinds of cosmic material, and allowing, eventually, for the existence of subatomic particles like quarks and bosons and then atoms, which form to create stars, and some billions of years later, all of the other fun stuff we've come to know and love and live on and eat and take out for walks in the afternoon and buy at the mall and send Christmas cards to every year, even though we never really see them anymore, but like, it would be weird to suddenly stop sending Christmas cards, right? I think it would be. Hashtag star stuff. It's that thing that Kramer sonified. All that stuff happening in a super zoomed out way, of course. His sonification lasts about a hundred seconds. 
and it sounds like this. I'm not going to pretend to understand exactly how Kramer managed to do this. Well, except for the fact that he did it in Mathematica, which is cool. I used to program audio filters in Mathematica. They sounded awful. I definitely never did anything approaching, you know, astrophysical sonification. So given my lack of expertise, but also the fact that even if I don't fully grok lots of this in detail, but I find it truly fascinating, I hope you won't mind if I let Kramer speak for himself for a bit. Regarding 2003 research, which inspired his 2013 sonification, Kramer wrote in Analog Science Fiction slash Fact magazine about how someone emailed him based on earlier work he'd done. They were asking if there was any existing recording of the sound of the Big Bang, a thing he theorized could possibly exist given available data and technology. This person wanted to know about the existence of such a thing because her son, who was in fifth grade, would like to use it for a report. He responded no, that it didn't exist. But, and here's where I'll just let Kramer start speaking for himself. I was fascinated by the idea of synthesizing the Big Bang sound, and it ran around in my head for a day or so. I decided that I wanted to hear what the Big Bang sounded like. So, one Saturday morning, when I should have been doing something else, I downloaded the frequency spectrum measured by the WMAP, the satellite probe that has done a definitive job of mapping the cosmic background radiation and was featured in one of my recent columns. Then I quickly wrote a 16-line Mathematica program that read the WMAP data, produced the sound as a mathematical function, and saved it to my hard drive as a WAV file. One Saturday morning, you know, just fire up ye old Mathematica and synthesize the sound of the universe being created. But okay, we're getting closer to our point about sounds and space and if it's actual sound that happens in actual space and how it all relates to that hill in New Jersey. What, over a hundred seconds of the Big Bang, are we actually hearing? Kramer writes, The universe was expanding and becoming more of a, quote, bass instrument, while the cosmic background radiation was being emitted. To put it another way, the expanding universe stretches the sound wavelengths and thereby lowers their frequencies. To account for this effect, the program shifts the waves downward in frequency to follow the expansion in the first 760,000 years of the universe. How fast the universe initially expanded depends upon what cosmological model is used. The sound frequencies used in the simulation must be scaled upward by a huge factor. About 10 to the 26th 
power to match the response of the human ear, because the actual Big Bang frequencies, which had wavelengths on the order of a fraction of the size of the universe, were far too low to be heard by humans, even had any been around. So what we're listening to is the sound of the universe growing in size, which makes sense. When the universe is very small, the waves of energy created by all that activity are small and close together, but as the universe expands, which, as it turns out, it does do and is still doing, the waves get further and further apart, and so they drop in pitch. But the whole thing is happening at the scale of a universe. So even those small, densely packed, high waves are impossibly low, like the sound of the black hole. So as was the case with the black hole, the sound of the expanding universe must be pitched up. Lots. On the question of if this is actual sound that would have been actually happening in the universe at its beginning, Kramer writes, The Big Bang sound in the simulation is derived from the sound propagating as compression waves through the plasma-slash-hydrogen medium of the early universe some 100 to 700,000 years after the initial Big Bang. The density of this medium was changing as the universe expanded, but should have been considerably more dense than air on our little planet. One does not need air to have sound, only some medium in which compression slash rarefaction waves can propagate. So there we have it. Eons ago, yes. Impossibly far beyond the range of human hearing, yes. But sound? as we would tend to describe it today? Also yes. Turns out in space, no one can hear you scream, but if they have very well calibrated scientific equipment, they might be able to hear the sound of a universe being created. Now, back to Wilson and Penzias and their hiss, which, as it turns out, is also the sound of the Big Bang. Or, more accurately, the sound the universe in general makes as a result of the Big Bang having happened. The hiss these guys discovered when they pointed their antenna at literally anything is the sound of some of the first photons still hanging around the universe after having been dispersed by the Big Bang. They got this mysterious reading from everywhere because, hey, there are photons still hanging around from the Big Bang everywhere. This is especially a great combination of funny, interesting, ironic, and sad because Wilson and Penzias at the time actually didn't believe in the Big Bang. They weren't creationists, no. They were supporters of the other competing theory of the universe called steady state theory. Steady state theory says that as the universe expands, new matter is constantly being created. Simply stated, the state of the universe doesn't change. It is, therefore, non-teleological. It has no beginning and no end. It just is. Universe. Full stop. This theory was popular for a bit in the 20th century, but the theory of relativity poked some holes in how the universe would have to work in order for the steady state theory to be true. Edwin Hubble, who, yes, has the telescope named after him, showed that the universe is not producing a steady state, that as a whole, it is changing over time. And if one were to deduce the starting conditions of that expansion, one would reach, ta-da, the Big Bang indicating the universe did have a beginning, and whoops, might have an end. Let's not talk about that right now. Anyways, it was only after they reached out to Robert Dick, frustrated with the malfunction of their antenna, vexed and nonplussed and out of ideas, that Dick said, hey, wait a minute. Because not long before, Dick had theorized that if the Big Bang had happened, there would have to be some kind of low-level radiation detectable throughout 
the entire universe. He was in the process of building a radiometer attempting to find that low-level radiation when he got the call from Bell Labs. In talking with Slate, again, Wilson describes how there was no real aha moment where they figured it all out. Rather, over a long period of time, they realized their readings coincided with theoretical descriptions of the early universe, which provided further backing for a theory of an expanding universe, and by extension, that of the Big Bang. So alongside Pyotr Leonidovich Kapitsa, quote, for his basic inventions and discoveries in the area of low temperature physics, in 1978, Arno Allen Penzias and Robert Woodrow Wilson were awarded the Nobel Prize, quote, for their discovery of cosmic microwave background radiation, end quote. Which, they originally thought, was radio hiss caused by bird poop. My name is Mike Rignetta, and this podcast has been Reasonably Sound. You can find Reasonably Sound on Twitter and Instagram at Reasonably S-N-D. And you can find me, Mike Rignetta, on Twitter, Instagram, and Tumblr at Mike Rignetta. Mike Rignetta.